You are listening to a Higher Things production. Higher Things is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to make the gifts of Christ Jesus known to youth and young adults through gospel rich content like you are about to hear. Consider joining our supporters who make this ministry possible by donating at higherthings.org slash giving or by clicking the link in the show notes. And now, Higher Things presents The Uncultured Saints with Pastors Eli Leedsow and Harrison Goodman. All right, so we left off at chapter two, huh? I think so. Okay. Yeah, yeah qu- squeaky chair again. Do you want me to stand up again? I just... It's just so squeaky. Like we're on it's video now, chair. so at least at least people know where the squeak is coming from because they're watching you like pretend to ride a bucking bronco over there now. It goes, it goes, a, it goes way back. It's yeah, nice. man. Like, yeah, that's. Uh, How that, do you that, not have a square a, a chair that squeaks? That's my question. I WD forty. I don't know. Um, Every chair I've ever had. This is like a, a year old and it's a squeaky chair. Well, but do you just sit there all day long just rocking back and forth in it? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm willing to believe you, but I stumped you, didn't I? I got, yeah. I, I got a couch. I got I got nice furniture in here. Why would you I do. be sitting there? It's super nice. No, Why it's cozy. Would I be... Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's know. it's a lot of fluorescent lights to to reflect off of your dome, but otherwise it's a super it's a super cozy vibe. You could get some lamps in there, and uh, yeah, really. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, no. Some of my parishioners uh, uh, thought it, it'd be good. Uh, the 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 office was um, it had a giant like presidential desk. Yeah, um, I remember, and that giant cardboard cutout of Vince Vaughn from Dodgeball, and the no books. Like people were like, "Is this is this a place where you pray and study, or or just quote that movie incessantly?" <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So it wasn't comfortable. People didn't like it. So, anyways, Mark two actually actually had a actually had a giant cardboard cutout of Vince Vaughn from the movie Dodgeball. I stole from the movie theater I used to work at. You were forgiven. Thanks. <laughs> It's important. <laughs> Did you? I heard they're doing it's dodgeball too. Are they? I, I heard Vince Vaughn is is is. They trying are to, all getting way too old to dodge, let dip, alone dodge, dipped up and dive. Dodge, yeah, right. and dodge for a second time. Yeah, right. Oh. Yeah, they're definitely getting hit by wrenches this time. I mean, it's comedy. Yeah. If you could dodge a wrench, you could dodge a ball. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was this chapter two, everybody. Uh, uh, it was reported that he, being Jesus, was at home, and many were gathered together, so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when he and when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus said this, questioned within themselves, and he said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. I added a couple more thus thus things in there, but <clears throat> anyways. It's it's for flavor. Right. <laughs> I got lost with my eyes that I couldn't find which line I was on. Do you ever do that when you're reading in church and just start <laughs> <laughs> all the time? <laughs> oh, it freaks me out. And then you're in front of everybody and your heart just starts going. <laughs> Confidence then... is key, I guess. <laughs> Oh, I hate it. <laughs> All right, this is one of the best, most uh, well. Well, I don't know. I remember hearing this in Sunday school, and and uh, I remember the uh, 
the teacher having uh, uh, the felt that you could put on the felt boards. You didn't grow up in the Christian. Uh, we didn't Luther. have this, yeah. yeah. But we had felt. It was a big felt board, and then like a billion different biblical felt characters and cows. And- so, did the LCMS invest in felt? At like a very like, did they they get on the ground floor of this? Because we got banners, we got. Sunday I school. think I th- I think somehow they got uh, they got, got on the in ground tight floor with, with felt with big yeah. felt. Robert and, T. Felt, um, right. I think was his name. Right. <laughs> yeah. And they, yeah, they invested heavily with big, big, big felt. Um, but it worked so what well you for with, a while. Yeah. What did you do? What did you do with your Sunday school wall? I don't know. Oh, oh, I remember. I remember the teacher uh, showing with this felt the the paralytic guy being lowered in through. Okay. I, I just have a. I just have a visual. A vivid image. Right. On felt. Right. But I mean, anyway, so what do you have to say about this one, man? This is a horrible. This is a this is a horrible podcast. But we're meandering up towards it. Uh, I think that uh, we kind of talked last time about what Jesus might have been doing when he was preaching in the temple, and I think it's sort of the same thing. And I think he preaches the same sermon to the guy who's late to church. Uh, your sins are forgiven. I, I think this is sort of the the thing to be talked about over and over again. Um, but to I, be fair, I think he's, the, he's only late to church because the church is jam packed. And well, and yeah, his friends are still bringing him. Actually, I think this is this is sort of the beautiful part um, is that uh, Jesus doesn't sort of see the faith of the paralytic or his or sort of his deep longing to be there or like his best intentions. Like if I could walk out, I'd definitely been front in this room. But he, he simply he recognizes the faith of a community that would would see their hurting, find help and, and rejoices. Um, ours is not a God who sort of sits in, in the front row and, and waits for the people who don't really need him so that he can gra- congratulate them, but, but rather he, he, he's established a, a kind of norm in his house that if there's ever anybody hurting, there's help here. And that should be so normative that if you know people who are hurting, it's good to, to bring them to help too. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I never really, I mean, that's beautiful. I never really went that way with a sermon or a Bible study, but that, I mean, if you're ever looking for a third use, here it is, right? Bring, bring your I, friends and those so, who are but I mean, That's actually Jesus. it though. That's most of the time how we talk about witness. And it's, it's sort of always done under the law of like, do you, do you want somebody to go to hell or not? Cause like, if you do, that's cool. Jesus can talk to you about it. But like, if you don't want people to go to hell, bring them to church. Um, and, and you know, we'll see how much you actually care about them by whether or not you're willing to like, don't ruin the felt don't, don't open the roof, but like, you know, bring them politely to church and like, make sure they've had a a firm talking to about how to behave there, uh, before, before you sit them down, but uh, definitely bring your friends to church. Um, no, what, what it is though, is, is it's a recognition. Like if there's a car accident in front of you, um, you don't need to sort of be coerced into, to dialing 911. It's just, I, I want there to be help here for this person. And, and I know where help is. Um, I, I think in a lot of ways, if you see church as an obligation, I, it's really hard to see witness as anything other than obligation too. But if if you see church as, as sort of sustenance, oxygen, uh, when, when when you're starved for it, hope, when when you live amongst hopelessness and you, you have somebody in your life who is going through that, it, it's easy to sort of say like, let's, let's go to get help together. Right. Yeah. And then that way church is of the gospel and gift as opposed to <clears throat> coercive in nature. Yeah. It it's less of a pyramid scheme if Jesus is actually here for giving sins. And it, it's also radically different from the way that we talk, at least internally, about missions, because like we don't say it ever outside of our walls or meetings. And and we definitely don't like put it on the posters or like the the cheesy church signs that we're convinced will just have the crowds are rushing on in because we made a pun. Uh but like we we talk in in our meetings most of the time about how there's never enough. Um, there, there's, there's never enough people to serve on all the boards. We need a new trustee. Nobody wants to be treasurer anymore. And, and like, also, uh, everybody's getting old and nobody's going to give in, in about 15 years. So what we really need is, is some fresh blood. And what we really mean here is we need some fresh work. Um, were it, you, it, were you at my last PPC meeting? I don't know what even PPC <laughs> is. Um, <laughs> see, but this is the other, give me, give me some more church acronyms I have to memorize before I can ever come have my sins forgiven, please. Um, <laughs> Ah, oh, no, you're, you, you, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. 
So, I mean, like, what if we actually, instead of any of those things, recognize, like, Jesus is in the center of your church, actively forgiving sins and granting life to the dying. That That's really all it is. And, and then you can sort of say, like, you know what, Every yes, everybody needs Jesus, but like, some people need him more some weeks than others. And all it really is, is like, look, there's somebody who cannot get there on his own. And they think there's help there. So they, they take their friend to help. That's that's really all it, it needs to be. It's not even a law thing. Um, it's It's a look where help is thing. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> it is. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a head and heart thing, not just a, a, a fulfilling the law with my, with my hands. It's this, mm-hmm. w- it's the gift of the gospel that actually enlivens you to, to care for your neighbor. Um, but yeah, so going to that forgiveness of sins uh, that you had spoken of last time um, with uh, Jesus is speaking of, uh, with authority and everybody's just flabbergasted because they've never heard it spoken this way. I think, I think you're right. It's, it is this forgiveness of sins. And I think it's this forgiveness of sins in the here and now, not in the abstract, because certainly the old Testament would speak of sins forgiven. Um, but not in the here and now, I don't think, I mean, I mean, they would at the temple, but not in the way that Jesus would have been doing it. Right. So it's, it's almost backwards, um, at least the way we want to think about it. Like we, we talk about this, like in the Old Testament, they had the miracles in the here and now, but the forgiveness was far off. And and here in this parable that the, the forgiveness is here and now, but the, the miracle seems far off. The people are looking for that. Um, and what if they were the same thing? Right. Um, like I, this is actually something I think that, that maybe gets mixed up in it is that um, – a miracle is properly it, – it's creation being restored to how it's supposed to work. Um, well, the reason it doesn't work is because of because of sin. The, the, well, at the least thing the healing Jesus, miracles, right. All of them. Like even all of earth fell. Like all creation fell with Adam's fall. Like like even the, the, so the danger – the rabbit, storms rabbit, and seas. Rabbit hole. Rabbit hole. Go. So, uh, so in in the perfection of the garden, uh, Adam and Eve could have walked on water. I know that there wouldn't have been a storm to take their boat. Maybe. Like I, I, I'm not saying every single Maybe. miracle, but like in, in this way. But the greater miracle for the walking on water, though, isn't the walking on water. It, it's the calming of the storm when right. when they're back. Like well, the, the greater of the miracle is actually it's the rescuing Peter and pulling him up out of death. Um, all of the miracles in the story yeah, are, are go. go I don't, on, we don't have, no, we don't have time for this rabbit hole. Let's, uh, uh, no. <laughs> I, could, I could go so far, so fast, and I don't want to. I'm shocked. Yeah, I know. It's like a diatribe on Weezer or something. Um, so <laughs> don't give me stuff. What if, uh, what if Jesus forgiving the sin is actually um, a promise to pay for it himself? Yeah. What if um, if this is the case? Because the miracles have a cost. Like when Jesus forgives the sins, he can't say to the guy, "Your sins are forgiven" without dying on the cross. But if there is no more sin, there can be no more well, no more paralysis in the resurrection. We will run and not be weary. If there is no more sin, there can be no leprosy. If there there is no more sin, there there can be no um, blindness. Uh, what we have is Jesus promising to set the world right in the resurrection. That has a cost, and that means then that when we talk about miracles, like they're connected to the forgiveness of sins. Sometimes you get to see them this side of glory, and sometimes sometimes they they are seemingly a little further off but like jesus is paying the price for the miracle by forgiving the sins right he's putting a down payment on it right and the thing i mean and he does so in the uh in the actual uh uh language and and tense right getting boring with the Mm. the verb tense right it's it's what that's a present tense and i think it's a present tense in the greek there too right so this isn't had Right, your your sins have been forgiven in the abstract. It's not your sins will be forgiven. It's it's Jesus speaking right there. Right there. Your sins are forgiven now, right now, right. presently. Your sins are it's, forgiven. It's infuriating to the scribes and the Pharisees and anybody who doesn't like absolution in church and decides to quote the Bible but doesn't realize who they're they're actually quoting when they say no one can forgive sins but God alone. Um, right, God, and, and, God does. Well, and, right. That's the and point. That's, that's and that's the beautiful thing there. And then and then this is when Jesus pulls up that son of man stuff, which doesn't make any sense. Like son of like son of man was Old Testament stuff. You see that in Daniel. I think you might see that elsewhere Ezekiel? too. I think so, maybe. Um but when I was doing my study and a couple of the commentaries that I was reading, it, they were saying that um like nowhere would have the forgiveness of sins been directly tied to old testament son of man stuff 
So, so then Jesus comes here and he's speaking of son of man. And, and it's kind of an ambiguous thing too, because again, during that present day and age, like this wasn't a title that was used. Uh, nobody was running around calling themselves the son of man. And nobody was saying like the Messiah who comes is going to be son of man. So when Jesus is using this son of man language, it's just kind of like, what? Nobody's understanding why he's using this language. They got to kind of think back. But then they're saying, and so son of man, I think Jesus is 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 speaking of himself as the Messiah, but also speaking of himself as kind of this Israel reduced to one sort of thing, as Daniel and Ezekiel kind of might allude to a little bit. Um, but then it's this back and forth, right? Nobody can forgive sins except God alone. And yet here we've got Jesus who's saying it, and he's saying that the Son of Man can do it. And I mean, so, it's... Kind of, but also kind of not, because like in, in the Son of Man texts throughout the Old Testament, of course there's forgiveness of sins. It's all about resurrection through Daniel and Ezekiel. Uh, you have Ezekiel, Son of Man, prophecy over these bones and say to them, live. How does that happen but through the forgiveness of sins? Uh, Daniel the prophet had, had sees the person that, uh, the, the, the second person of the Trinity uh, walking around in, in the fiery furnace, keeping them safe through death. Um, there, how, how do you sort of avoid these things. I think part of the problem is that we use too much church language to the point where we forget what it means. It's sort of even when we started and we have the baptizer saying, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And everybody's like, let's pet it. Um, and not, it should bleed for us. Um, right. We, we, we have church language that's used with a, with a very explicit purpose. And, and when you don't know what, know what those purposes are, just because everybody uses the language all the time, like maybe, maybe the, the it, language is passed out of parlance, but maybe it was just sort of overused too. But but I think I think that's the thing. I think I think you and I are, are able to. Um, I think we're able to to look back and 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 get these quick Google searches of where it is oh, in Ezekiel and Daniel, right? And then, but also, uh, we're sitting here two thousand years removed, where we understand that Jesus oftentimes calls himself the Son of Man. So I think I think he's. I wouldn't be surprised if Jesus is is not being aloof, right, in using this Son of Man reference. Because you've got these guys coming to attack him, and then he's going to uh he's gonna explain why he can say this forgiveness of sin stuff, but then he's gonna bring something in where they can't come and attack him again because they gotta say, like, what in the world is he talking about? And the but whole he's time. Doubling- down on i mean he, he's using the the loaded language of the prophets that that spoke for god but he's doing the things that only god can do um like he, he's not actually challenging like only whether or not god can forgive sins or not he's saying the son of man right here right now does have authority on earth to forgive sins and and here look pick no, up your bed he's, and walk he's actually saying uh resurrect yeah, pick up your you, bed and walk sorry you guys you guys are right only god can forgive sins <laughs> Very good. You're absolutely right. He uses the resurrect word too. Rise, resurrect, same same word in Greek. Pick up your bed and go home. Um, and here we we have again. It's a callback. I think I think Son of Man is twisting the knife. Like I actually do. He, he's he's not looking for a fight, but but he's sure going to double down on the identity. No, I I agree. I just think the original because uh, uh, what happens right? Jesus calls them out. And he calls, he silences them. They're not, they're not saying out loud. They don't, the, the, the scribes or Pharisees, whichever one it is, the scribes who are sitting there at the most prominent place. Um, they're not, uh, they're not questioning and calling Jesus out They're They're maybe mumbling this with each other, or as I think yeah. Mark says it, they're questioning it in their hearts. So no, Jesus, like <laughs> Jesus showing his divinity is, is calling them out saying, I know exactly what you're thinking. And why are you asking that question? So, so it's, it. It's like when the people are sitting in the pews at church and they're like, he's adding a lot of thuses to the readings and you have to know their thoughts. <laughs> right. Exactly. No, but no, it, it's so, yeah, I think, I think in the exact moment when this is happening, uh, the scribes are left um, without a word in their mouth. They don't know what to say because mm-hmm. this man who's doing something audacious, like forgiving sins uh, he also is the same one who just knew exactly what I was thinking, and that creeps me out. Um, and then he then he backs up 
this audacious, miraculous, only God thing can do by telling this guy to get up and walk. And I've just saw all of this happen in the last 30 seconds. And I am speechless. No, never seen anything like this. Right. Um, transition scene. And he went out again beside and the sea. And thus, all the crowd was coming to him. And thus, he was teaching them. And mm-hmm. thus, as he passed by, thusly, he saw Levi, the son of <laughs> Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And thusly, he said to them, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with the tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. It came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Yeah, I'm curious when the scribes of or and, depending on how you want to translate that uh, uh, uh of the pharisees or and the pharisees i wonder where they're at in this whole thing like are they all around the tax booth right or are they getting called in like hey jesus just called this tax collector to come and follow him that's strange and then they kind of hmm. like where are they again it's all speculative and it doesn't really matter but like i wouldn't think they're in Matthew's Levi's uh, house, right? Because they're they're calling out Jesus for dining with with uh, tax collectors and sinners. So, like, are they like looking from the alleyway into the house? Like, I mean, it says they followed him. Many followed him. Um, not just the tax collectors and sinners, but probably the sinners, like the Pharisees and 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 their scribes. Um, wait, they're sinners too. I think this is sort of driving at the point of it. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I, I, I <laughs> that part actually it it makes a lot of sense to me. Like they, it's they they start out with with sort of high hopes for Jesus. They they really actually do. Um, Wait, hold they on. Keep, not in Mark. Not in Mark. Uh-uh. Keep going. And again, I'm not smart. I had to read this right. <laughs> um, the uh, like the the other synoptics, Matthew and Luke. I'm not sure yeah. about John, but Matthew and and, and Luke. Uh, those two gospel writers portray uh, the the Pharisees and the scribes as people who are curious and they're like, okay, this this Jesus guy might have something to say. But the first time that you see the scribes of the Pharisees in Mark is is here it's in chapter right two from the get go, and, yeah. and 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 they're sitting there listening to Jesus, and immediately they're like, I don't like what he's saying. I don't like mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fair. So they, they probably heard about it from sort of at least inside of Mark alone that the first initial temple narrative. Um, and then, yeah, they came to see for themselves and and not a fan, not a fan. It's not right. how they used to do it when I grew up. Um, and uh, right. it's the wrong, wrong, wrong color hymnal, wrong color hymnal. All right. So um, if, if this is the case, then um, when Jesus recognizes all of these things. I, I think it's it's something to, to recognize that he spends just as much time, if not more, arguing with the Pharisees and the tax collectors, maybe not just to prove them wrong publicly, but actually because he wants them to receive mercy too. Well, yeah. So he says such a thing, like, you know, he he's only come to, uh, to what? Uh, to, 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 to. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners, right? So, the way that he speaks about this, if you take it at face value, you have to say, okay, what he means there is that there are righteous ones and that there are sinful ones, right? And then the righteous ones obviously don't need, just like a healthy person doesn't need a, a physician, right? There's no reason to go get a checkup, mm-hmm. um, right? And tell you, yeah, no. Um, but <laughs> um, this this seems to be what Jesus is saying, but obviously we know that he isn't. I mean, earlier he's got John the Baptist calling everybody to repentance, right? And Jesus says the same sort of thing uh, at the beginning of, of John chapter 1, 2. He's preaching the same sort of thing, this repentance stuff. Um, so it's, it's just this brilliant way of saying, no, you righteous people, why would I be eating with you, Pharisees? You don't need me. Well, wink, except wink. like... Yeah, because he says, I, I he, he, he literally, he declares, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners, but he is calling to the Pharisees this statement, like he is calling right. to them right now. Right. And, and he's saying, I'm only here to call sinners as I call you. I, I mean, you guys pay, pay attention, pay, you know, 
connect the dots. You get what I'm laying down? You give no? no? Still okay. okay. <laughs> we'll we'll keep going with it. But sure. Um no, but it, it again it paints a picture of what church is. And it's it's the same thing from uh the uh the, the story before. Uh what is church? Is is church sort of a place for the good to get better or a place for the bad people who can't be good? Um church is is the hospital. You're not going to the hospital for fun. This is not where you just sort of want to just like spend a day and, and you know, watch the prices right in a waiting room. Uh, we're at the hospital because somebody's having a rough time. This is this is the point of the church. Right. And so, yeah. And so you walk, you walk out, right, with that balm and healing, right? You walk mm-hmm. out with with your wounds all all taken care of, like the parable of the Good Samaritan type thing, right? That's the reason. And yes, you very well might feel better then, which is great, or you might not, but that's okay too, because your sins are still forgiven. So yeah, that's the, that's the difference. And, and we do it too. Um, it's, it's the, uh, self-righteous, um, self-righteousness in us all, uh, where it's really easy to a turn church into, or B C church as, um, a place where only the righteous ones, inherently righteous ones, hang out, right? As opposed to the place where, no, 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 um, the sinners are there. And yes, they're righteous, but they're righteous because of Christ. They're not inherently righteous at all. Which is, It shifts the... Go ahead. No, I was going to say, which is always... Uh, it, it bums me out so much... Um, when I hear talking with, you know, people in, in, in the neighborhood or whatnot, uh, or people who haven't come to church in, in 30 years, um, where they've got this inherent feeling like they got to clean up their lives before they can go in there or, or funerals. I got a funeral tomorrow. Right. And you always have those people who have been like, man, I haven't, I thought it was going to, the whole place was going to burn down when I walked in. I haven't been here in 40 years. The only reason I'm here is the funeral. So this this actually has some of the language. Um, so when we grab hold of this, um, so if, if the church is like something, if, if we're going to sort of stretch Jesus' parable here, the those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I think we want to see the church as a hospital more than a hospice center. Um, the, the hospital is where you go to get better. Uh, and, and so, you know, if, if you're actually intent on cleaning up your life, if you're actually intent uh, on on getting better, so to speak, let's go to the hospital. But the hospice is where you go to die. Like, comfort me until at last I close my eyes and they don't open again until the last day. This is, I, I think, maybe the greater image um, that, that we have a great physician who is honest enough about his career to recognize it because doctors, the, the best doctors in the world are just sort of prolonging the game. Um, you know, the, the best pediatricians, the best oncologists in the world. They're just trying to buy time. They can't actually make you live forever. We, we, we need a, a hospice for sinners. We, we need a place where we can go and be spoken to words of comfort until we die so that last we live. And, and this is actually the, the whole point of it. Church is not to make you sort of better so you can get back out there and get back to the things that you want to do. Church is simply the place where you go to find comfort until you die, and then you can wake up and, and finally be through. I like that. <clears throat> So I'm not going to add anything more to that. It was well done. Thusly, he, Thusly uh, do you want to let you want to stop or you want to you want to keep going? I think. Well, uh, well, I'm looking at the little ticker up there. Uh, it looks like yeah. we're coming right at uh, 30 minutes. Okay. Okay. Thusly, we out. All right. <laughs>